Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidrin. Today's conversation is with singer, songwriter, and musician Joe Laurie. Originally from Australia, Joe began as a jazz singer. She moved to the States for graduate school and had already started to establish herself as a very reputable and hip jazz singer when she was invited pretty much out of the blue to audition for a tour uh, as a backing vocalist with Sting. That was several years ago, and since then she's toured and recorded extensively with him, appearing on his records and DVDs and traveling all over the world. Her association with Sting is what led her to be involved in the documentary film 20 Feet from Stardom, which won an Academy Award earlier this year, and in which she's featured among many of the great backing vocalists in popular music of the last half century. Joe released one solo record in 2008, which presented her in a mostly jazz context, and she's just finishing her follow-up project, which will be released later on this year. Between her first record and her new one, she really embraced songwriting, thanks in part to some encouragement from friends and colleagues like Doug Womble, Adam Levy, and Sting. Most of this information is more or less available to everyone online, on her website, and various sources. But the piece that I really wasn't expecting to find was just how significant Sting had been to Joe before she worked with him for the first time. She was raised in a very musical house where all of the kids in her large family played multiple instruments. But most of the music they listened to was religious music. And aside from some musical theater, for the most part, the first secular music that she really got into was the music of the police and of Sting. So not surprisingly, she has a somewhat spiritual connection to that music as well. There are some really wonderful moments in our conversation, and overall, my takeaway from her story was the importance of what you wish for and what you hope for, because it might come true. And when it does... Uh, you better be ready for it. She says, my story is pretty boring. Ultimately, my story is girl wants gig, girl gets gig, she is really happy, everything is great. In any case, she also dropped some very valuable sideman wisdom. I loved when she said that musicality is only one of the reasons people get hired or keep their gigs and suggested that when you're out for drinks with the most successful people you know uh, and it's your turn to buy a round, you should buy a round. Despite her absolute infatuation with her own sideman gig, it turns out she's a pretty brilliant songwriter in her own right, which is something she seems to be coming to terms with over time. She talks about overcoming her fear of the blank page and taking charge of her writing. Specifically, I like the distinction she makes between trying to write something great and simply trying to write something. Once she got past worrying about writing great songs, she was able to develop a regular writing regimen, and that's what led her to write great songs. Her new record features all original songs and arrangements, and it's really wonderful. Before we get started with the conversation, here's the title track to her forthcoming solo release called Taking Pictures.
Joe Laurie, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. I am so curious to talk to you in part because I really don't know you that well. And so this is a nice opportunity for me. Sometimes I do these conversations and I kind of know the answers ahead of time and I Mm -hmm. really don't know the answers. So I'm excited to find out. Well, I don't know the questions, so it's a good start. (laughs) (laughs) Then we're on even footing to start with. One of the things that I do know about you is that musicians really love you and respect you. You seem like a singer that musicians really dig. Oh, wow, that's really nice. I know you're from Australia. Mm-hmm. How did you come to music initially? Well, it's sort of the boring cliche of born into a musical family. I'm the youngest of five kids, and music was very important in both my parents' families. My grandmother was a piano teacher. That was my paternal grandmother and my mother's family. Everybody played instruments and some professionally. And in our family, we were all supposed to learn two instruments and do an hour of practice on one and half an hour of practice on the other every day. They got a bit lax by the time they got to me. But it was interesting because uh, musicianship, music was very important in my family to study. But until they got to me, no one was really permitted to pursue it as a serious career. So, you know, I have some really talented, really musical brothers and sisters who are much older than me, uh, actually. Um, So they really coached and taught me from a very young age. My eldest brother is 13 years older and, you know, one of the main things we did together was that he would sit at the piano and he would make up games and test me on things or make me sing a song and he would reharmonize it and take it further and further and see if I could hang on. And this is, you know, when I was two or three, it was just him mucking around as a 15-year-old who's into jazz. I know that a couple of my siblings would have really loved to pursue music as a career but it wasn't really something my parents were super into the idea of I think and it's funny when it came to me I wanted to be a doctor and they're like no I think we really think you're going to be a musician. (laughs) So do you think that they recognize something in you as opposed to your your siblings that it was available to you to be a professional musician or was it going through this five times they finally just kind of were worn down? I think youngest kids tend to be really carefree and and I think In my parents' observation, that might have translated to not as good a student. It's funny because I did quite well academically at school, but I think they thought, well, she's not quite as kind of single-minded in her pursuit of studies and exams and stuff. Maybe she's not really cut out for academia. (laughs) And what what did your parents do that they were so musical? Uh, Well, my mum's a pharmacist who wanted to be a doctor, actually, um, but wasn't really, you know, in that generation, it was a little bit odd in Australia for some, you know for some people for women to be doctors and my father is, has a PhD in chemistry he's in, in organic chemistry and he's a chemistry teacher mm-hmm. so um I started performing publicly as well a lot of young uh, my other siblings did maybe they might have done some competitions and things all within the context of study but I growing up singing I started performing quite young in in churches and mm-hmm. stuff like that and started doing performances around my city, not just at my church, but at other churches from, you know, I say 10 or so. And then I got a job in Les Miserables as one of the kids. And that was kind of my taste of working, you know, every day working a salaried job as a musician. And I just... And how old were you? I was 12. And it was in your town? It was in my town. When Les Mis toured Australia, they had a touring company, but... In each city, they would have a new cast of kids. So it was a few months, and only Adelaide kids performed in the Adelaide production. And I just thought, this is what I want to do. And when it was over, I just thought my life was over. I think I sobbed uncontrollably for about a solid week and just thought, I, I have to get back out there somehow, you know. 
before Les Mis, the music that you were into, obviously, at least one brother was into jazz, it sounds like, but was it a jazz house necessarily? Or was it a, what was the music in the house? The music in the house was, from my parents' perspective, mostly Christian music, Evie and uh, Billy Graham singers and lots of pretty tame Christian music. My older sister, there was a lot of Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith, so mm-hmm. some contemporary Updated. Christian pop. And then uh, my auntie, uh, who who died long before I was born, she died when she was 24, she was a folk singer and she had actually made several albums for, I think it was Capitol Records. It was a big deal. It was, you know, back in, in sort of the early 60s, you know, making a record on a label was a pretty big deal and she made three of traditional mostly English and Irish folk songs like Scarlet Ribbons and The Water is Wide and Scarborough Fair and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So I grew up listening to those things a lot as well. And then from my brother's collection, it was so much police. Um, Wow. Quite a lot of Sting and a little bit of Queen, but Sting before all. So I was indoctrinated from a very early age to, to love Sting. And that became a really strong connection between my oldest brother and my youngest sister who's still older than me mm-hmm. and and later me so my brother kind of bonded with my sister over the love of sting and when he f- first came to adelaide on his solo tour my brother kind of snuck my sister out of school and they lined up all day for tickets and he took her you know and from then on they would listen to the music together and they would go to see the things together and then they would start to teach me to, to love this music as well. And I, I absolutely did. So by the time I was a teenager, I would have definitely said, if someone said, you know, who's your favourite artist, it would have always been Sting. And so I spent so much time singing along to those records from a really early age. It sounds like you had a lot of musical education in your house and you had access to people who could really kind of help you along early on. I'm curious about what the greater musical education in Australia was like at that time. When I moved to New York about 10 years ago, it seemed a little surprising to me how many Australian musicians, particularly singers and female singers, there there were here, and all of them really great and with a, a real diverse kind of point of view. I don't know anything about the scene in Australia, but it seems like there must be something going on there. Yeah, well, first of all... Uh... Australian university study doesn't really have any general education. The, the idea is that everything that you are supposed to complete um, by high school, you know, in terms of math, natural sciences, English, is all taken care of. So when you go to university to study something, you really just study that one thing and you don't have to do your physical education elective or anything like that. And also, every, for the most part, all the classes are compulsory. So everybody has to fulfill the same requirements uh-huh. and they can be pretty stringent. I went to Elder Conservatorium in the Adelaide University, just in my hometown. I had been pursuing an I course, hopefully, toward musical theatre. That's what I wanted to do all through high school, and that's you know was really heavily involved in that in high school. And then I took a year off after a lot. It's a very Australian and English thing to take what they call a gap year mm-hmm. um, after high school before you start preparing to study um, whatever you're going to pursue at university, and. Um, over that year, I, I was listening a lot to jazz and I started doing some gigs with my sister at a cocktail lounge and I got really, really into jazz and realised that I found it a lot more interesting to have some freedom to change the way that I sing a song each time rather than develop one way and then sing it the same way every night uh, in the same costume, you, you know, in, in terms of you know how it might be for me in musical theatre. And so I went to Adelaide University and... One thing that I think is very special about this course, and it tends to be pretty common in the Australian universities, is that there is no singer's stream. There might be a jazz choir, that's the ensemble that you're in or whatever, Mm -hmm. but there isn't a jazz vocal course that is different to the jazz instrumental course. So the singers and the drummers have to do the same theoretical study, perform the same requirements for their juries, for their um, performance exams, as the saxophonists. So, for example, you know, in my third year, I think it was third year, you know, I had to demonstrate that I could improvise over giant steps, (laughs) you know, at a specific tempo, or I had to show that I could outline arpeggios from the third to the ninth, or, you know, I had to demonstrate exactly the same sorts of things that the the saxophonists and the pianists had 
had to demonstrate. So that was incredibly challenging in yeah. the beginning. I thought, oh, I got into this because I wanted to sing jazz and sing songs. And, and I think I, I basically, I spent quite a bit of time in tears in that first year because it was just such a mystery to me and I found it really, really challenging. But I had a great teacher called Kanetra Miller who's now head of the vocal program at Howard University um, and runs a really well-known jazz vocal group called Afro Blue. And she studied as a jazz pianist and so she had all the know-how and wanted, demanded that her singers really step up and fulfill these requirements and not kind of find ways to get around them as as had been the way in the past I think and started to foster this really really strong vocal program and I think Adelaide in particular is really well known for that program I mean it has its flaws but to be so integrated uh, I think was a fantastic thing and so when I came to apply at some different schools when I wanted to do my master's I applied at NEC and I applied at Purchase College and I applied at UNC and I think that the auditions were something of a surprise to the to the panel. It, they may, you know, it was far less of a surprise to anyone who might have been at Adelaide University. So they yeah. thought they were making it as difficult as possible for yeah, you. Yeah, I think it, they did, and I, you know, we'd I'd I'd been subjected to yeah, some pretty so much worse. heavy demands. So. so that does speak to exactly that question. Then that the singers that that maybe are emerging out of that system in Australia are uh, somewhat more prepared than the singers that are starting out in the American educational system? Prepared for certain tasks and pe- maybe less prepared for others. Um, for example? But I think definitely prepared from a technical point of view and if they were to focus, if scatting over changes and showing that you know your stuff, if that were the only goal, then yes, I think they, they come out more prepared than, than from the average school. But then again, there are other things that, that might be neglected, perhaps... Most significantly, just the idea that I, I emerged from that school feeling like that was the be all and end all, and that was the most important thing to do uh, was to be able to improvise and not just to be able to improvise, but I'm aware now that what I felt subconsciously, I think, was the most important thing to me was to demonstrate that I could and to show other musicians, I know what I'm doing. And I don't think that really necessarily gives way to the most <laughs> soulful music on the planet. But it was a important time and it, and it provided me with some skills that hopefully can transfer in a more meaningful and sensitive way as I grow and develop as a, as a musician and as a human. Yeah. That really does speak to the first thing I said, though, which is that musicians dig you. And I think that it might not necessarily matter in the long run from the point of view of really reaching an audience or making soulful music, but it it also explains why you're able to hang on a technical level and on a music level. Because, you know, I think the same affliction affects a lot of musicians that come through demanding academic courses as well, which is that they all emerge feeling like our value is in being able to demonstrate Mm -hmm. our virtuosity, our craft, our technique. And ultimately, that may or may not really resonate with an audience or a public beyond the circle of other musicians that you're playing for. You know, I mean, I think it's like that there's many versions of the joke, but, you know, what's the definition of a gentleman? It's someone who knows how to play the accordion but doesn't. And I think <laughs> I wonder if that, you know, if yeah. I think the definition of of a, a lady in this case, uh, in, in my case, sometimes I think it's somebody who knows how to scat but, but doesn't. You know, I do think that I learned some important things, but when I emerged from university, every song – was a vehicle for a solo and it's so far from the case for me now and I rarely rarely scat which is so interesting because it was the full focus of almost all my practice for almost a decade was being able to scat yeah primarily the music that you were listening to then while while you were in school was jazz yes when I was in school but not exclusively jazz and and once I moved to grad school and moved here I really had to take a look at what I was listening to and how it compared to the music that I was making and to me, it seemed like they were worlds apart. And I, I started to wonder, well, if I don't want to listen to anyone scat, and I, it's going to sound like I'm totally demonizing scatting, which for the most part I probably am, but not you know unequivocally. But I thought if I am so uninterested in listening to a jazz vocal album since you know mm-hmm. 1970, if I'm if I'm not really interested in listening to that, then why am I pursuing making it? 
You know, it's one of the reasons in some way I, I feel really uncomfortable about my first record is it's, it's to me now, it's so clearly something made by someone who's just emerged from school. It's like checking boxes. I can do this and I can do this and I can do this. And it's a whole mixture of so many different things. And mm -hmm. it doesn't reflect at all what I was listening to at the time, which was Ricky Lee Jones and Randy Newman and, you know, all those, these great songwriters who technically, I mean, when you think of them, you know, from a technical perspective, are they the world's most technically proficient singers? Probably not. It sounds like maybe this new record that you're making, it would be more accurate now to say if you like Ricky Lee Jones you're more likely to like this record than the last one yeah I hope so and yet in, in some ways it's not completely devoid of the things that have been important to me as a student of music um, it's sort of I hope has distilled out the bits that I really care about there are some very 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 simple songs that could almost be classified as closer to a country song or a mm -hmm. simple folk song but there's also something that is in 13 that emerged sort of honestly and, and naturally on the keyboard it wasn't like I'm going to try to write something clever in 13 and that's one thing that I really admire about Sting is how he has introduced harmonically and rhythmically uh, and melodically he's introduced some non-pop sounds and approaches and some very advanced concepts to the average listener and you know it's almost like I feel like you know introducing something really challenging like anchovies to a very bland diet you know he finds hmm. a way to deliver them in an appetizing way and and I do I do think that that's interesting and worth doing because I would hate pop music to be limited to things in 4/4 four, four with you know an absolute maximum of five chords you know yeah there's something subversive about it in a way being mm -hmm. able to do that yeah. the question I wonder, somebody like Sting, for example, had the success of the police, and even that was in its own way kind of subversive because they were introducing a lot of outside elements into pop music. But it was a little more available to people who weren't necessarily accustomed to listening to non-mainstream pop music. You could love them as a rock band. Yeah, I think one critic at the time called it filet mignon on a paper plate, which mm -hmm. I thought was such a great description. The level of playing was so high and the mm -hmm. writing was so high. But, you know... When Sting launched his own solo career and he worked with some of the hippest musicians in the world and he started to introduce some of these new flavors, he was already a big star. Mm -hmm. And maybe people were prepared to sort of like continue loving him. It's interesting when you launch a pop career, I'm always curious how far you can go as an emerging artist in that way without being seen as a world music artist or a jazz artist or mm -hmm. a challenging artist. Well, I think that it's two-sided though because on, on the one hand, obviously his pre-existing fame would have been extremely helpful. But on the other hand, there's an expectation that he continue to do what he had done before. And I think we forget really quickly how a lot of these things are received at first. You take an album like The Soul Cages, which I think for many Sting fans is, is way up there in the favourites. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it was considered a flop. And for me, it was certainly one of my favourite albums. And I think that, you know, and there are things that when we play those songs on gigs, the crowd goes completely bananas mm -hmm. just as much as they might for Message in a Bottle. But at the time, as with almost every album that he has made in his solo career, it, it was viewed with suspicion and initial, I think in a lot of cases, initial disappointment because it took people a while, precisely because he was introducing something new that people had to get used to and they mm -hmm. took a little while to love. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a cha it's like challenging your audience in a exactly. certain way to catch up. Yeah, of course it's going to be met with resistance. but And I just love that he keeps, you know, it doesn't ever stop him. It doesn't stop him, you know, over and over again. Every time he makes an album, it's basically refusing to do what he's done before and insisting upon doing something that, you know, people are saying, no, why can't you just make another, you know, another Ten Summoners Tales? Well, for goodness sakes, Ten Summoners Tales when it first came out, if people were like, what are all these jazz solos and these odd time signatures? This will be a disaster and no one, you know, this is, he's, he's gone crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Since your first record, it does appear that one of the major changes in your musical life is your musical relationship with Sting, that mm -hmm. you started working with him. How did that come about? It's interesting because it's not completely unconnected from the musical training because um, there were some auditions conducted for a project that was coming up um, he had made the winter album uh, and he wanted to do a DVD filming. So he did all, most of the backing vocals on the album, but for the DVD filming they wanted several uh, backing singers. And Robert Saden was the producer mm -hmm. and what they were looking for 
were some specific skills they wanted singers who could read, uh, although in the end we didn't really do that, but there, there was kind of a laundry list of things. Familiarity with traditional folk song from England, Ireland, and Scotland, or just or so at least some kind of knowledge of that sort of thing and an approach to that. Familiarity with early choral music, uh, and also the ability to improvise. And so that's a that's kind of a specific skill set. And Lila Bialy, who's a really mm-hmm. fantastic singer songwriter and an amazing jazz pianist, and uh, she was in an early round of auditions and very favorably viewed. And they basically said, "Oh, well, you've got." You've like 90, 97% got the gig, but can you think of anyone else? Because we're still missing somebody. Not to replace you, but, you know, we're still missing somebody. Uh, we need, we want five, four, four people or five people uh, at the time. So I can't imagine being in her shoes and suggesting anybody, mm-hmm. frankly, because the last thing I would want to do would be to do myself out of, potentially do myself out of the gig if two people came along that they preferred, you know, and it's so subjective. But she did suggest me she suggested only me actually mm. and um i went into audition and thankfully we both got the gig yeah right <laughs> but i i mean i owe so much to lila for that recommendation because i was mainly i mean i was teaching beginner piano and that you'd was moved the, to you had finished graduate school and moved to new york i came to new york to study at grad school and i was trying to find a way to stay i came to do my master's i had begun my doctorate uh, i was almost finished my doctorate uh, and still am almost finished my doctorate. I was about where I am now. <laughs> um, and I was just finding ways to make ends meet. And I was doing some really, really interesting gigs, um, such as working in the Fred Hirsch Pocket Orchestra. Mm-hmm. I just finished something, a project with Donnie McCaslin. And I was doing some stuff that really excited me, but it certainly didn't pay the bills. And I was mainly just teaching piano and nobody from that world would have known who I was. So she kind of plucked me out of the blue there. There's kind of a weird thing that happened before that, which is that I had done this class called the Path Class, which is a bit like the artist's way, but a different sort of approach. And I was just turning 30 and thinking, you know, I want to be doing more of the performing side of things and less teaching Mm -hmm. piano to beginner piano students. And I wrote, you know, one of the tasks we had to do was to write down you know, what we wanted to achieve without any limitations. And the piece de resistance that I put as my number one thing I wanted to do was to work with Sting. And I wrote this down on a piece of paper approximately six weeks before this call comes out of the blue saying, you know, are you available to audition for this this thing? And within 24 hours, I had a gig with Sting. It was really strange. At what point did you think about that piece of paper? Immediately. When I got the call, I just, I actually, um, yeah, I was really a little spooked. We knew we would find out very, very quickly and um, we thought we were going to find out by noon the next day and noon came and went and got to about 2 p.m. and I finally, I couldn't resist anymore and I thought I've got to call Lila and find out what she heard and she had gotten the gig and I hadn't heard anything and I, you know, I was so grateful that she had recommended me and I was so happy for her and, and I had really coached myself to feel okay, as okay as I could if I didn't get it. I thought, well, you know, it's an entree into that world and mm-hmm. you never know. Um, and we're talking about it. We we talked for quite a long time, and I was just asking her, what, "What's it going to be?" And what, how, you know, everything about it. And how did you find out? And how did you feel? She said, "Well, I got an email," and I just was so happy. And she was trying to be gentle because she knew that I would be, I was totally gutted. And uh, as she's talking, I just thought, you know, I do remember one of the emails that they sent me the day before went into junk mail. Maybe I'll just check my junk mail. And I looked in there and there it was. And I just screamed. And shortly after I did get on my knees and say a prayer of thanks. I just couldn't believe that this had happened. And it was such a kind of unlikely sequence of events. I was very, very grateful and and still am. What was the audition like? It was scary. (laughs) We had five singers at a time. What they did was basically five or six people at a time. Um, and I think essentially they only brought in people that they, you know, they'd checked out and they thought would be a good fit. So um, we were sort of in auditioning as a group. Uh, it was in a great, that great studio on Ninth Avenue that isn't there anymore. Um, it was a really big one. It started with C. I'm trying to remember what it was called. But there were five or six microphones Clinton? set up. Clinton, yeah. yeah. And... Um, they would have us sing this one song and, okay, well, you sing the upper part, you sing, you know, okay, you lay out, you know, just every different permutation and listen to the different combinations. of, of And Lisa Fisher was 
there and she had performed on the album and she was a non-negotiable. She was going to be the section leader essentially and so the section was built around Around Lisa. Lisa's amazing. She Did you know Lisa before that? Not at all. And you know, we had a rehearsal period scheduled. We were gonna rehearse for several days at Sting's house in Tuscany before going to England to do another almost two weeks of rehearsals with all the musicians. It was a big project with many, many musicians, big, big band. Lisa took it upon herself to organise five solid days of rehearsal, basically, with just the four of us working on stuff at Michiko. And I don't think that was the expectation. And I just, you know, I was just agreeing to whatever I was told, you know. And so when we arrived at in Tuscany, you know, Sting said, okay, so have you heard any of the tracks? And we're like, um, yeah, we've we've worked on the bit, okay. And we, we sang the first thing and he he said, wow, I'm really excited that sounds let's try something else you know and he he went from sort of perplexed to just the smile kind of grew bigger and bigger and I think we got to the third song and he's like okay I think we're done for the day we can let's have a glass of wine and celebrate you know so Lisa really set us up so well for that it was an it was a really good education for me and you really didn't have a lot of experience in that world so what were your first impressions of that whole scene like meeting Lisa and seeing how she approached singing before then maybe you were focused on being more of a solo voice is that fair to say or yes although my choral background was pretty heavy from from a young age I I was in a a semi-professional sort of choir from age eight to almost 18 and we did some tours and stuff like that um so you know singing in a group and blending and and all that was a really um something that I was into and familiar with uh and also at university I'd been in this small jazz vocal group, which is a lot of close harmonies and Mm -hmm. and very tight blends and and stuff like that. But it was really challenging because all the things that I thought were so important seemed not to be important. I didn't really understand. It took a lot of getting used to. So if I would notice that something was missing in the chord or I thought, you know, I would have these sort of technical observations about something that I thought should change and I might raise my hand and say, okay, this is missing, you know, push my glasses up my nose and say, oh, excuse me, Uh, but I think we're missing the seventh in this. And um, eventually Lisa kind of had to shut me down (laughs) kindly and she basically saved me from myself. I didn't see it that way at the time. I was thinking, okay, I guess somebody, you know, needs to be in charge. It was only after I finally, you know, really had to be silent and just observe uh, that I realised that there was a whole group of musicians who also noticed things that were missing, who also noticed what might work here or there, and everyone of them was keeping their mouth shut as well until it was absolutely necessary. And that was one of the biggest lessons that I learnt from Lisa because I'd been coming from, yeah, just a very student perspective where raising your hand and pointing something out and noticing something first is a high-value thing that was maybe the single most important lesson I learned early on and probably a reason that I'm still on the gig is because Lisa helped me learn that lesson early and it was kind of a difficult painful one it was several months later that I finally started to really understand how that went down and I wrote her a thank you card and said I know I know that it wasn't easy to deal with me like I, I was somewhat resistant and and mildly offended and frustrated that I was kind of being hamstrung in a way you know mm-hmm. from asking questions or pointing things out or demonstrating how what much I do. knew and it was a really good lesson and I'm very grateful that she helped me learn it. Do you think that the fact that there are so many qualified brilliant musicians in that band and I'm sure in a lot of other sort of you know great great musicians who support great artists or Paul Simon or uh, whoever learning to sort of stand back and watch it happen and not necessarily raise your hand every time you have an idea. Do you think that in part that's what allows that artist to sort of maintain their integrity and the integrity of their sound? I mean, is that why people are keeping their mouths shut when they have ideas? I think there are a lot of reasons. Um, I think that when everybody says everything they think in a rehearsal, things go a million times more slowly and it's not your band. One thing I noticed is that we always got there in the end and it, we always sort of arrived, you know, maybe there would, you know, let's say you go to a rehearsal break and you kind of elbow somebody that you're sitting next to and say, hey, did you notice that or whatever? And they're like, yeah, yeah, I noticed that. And, you know, it's something that always gets solved, not by you, and it doesn't have to be solved by you. And 
it's their exploration. It's Sting's exploration. And there have been plenty of times when I've observed him doing something that I was thinking wouldn't work, you know, and I was positive that it might not work. And then it did. And it might take some time, but it's his band and he knows what he's doing and he's, he's been doing this for long enough uh, that he doesn't need all of us to weigh in. That said, he's, he'll ask, you know, when he's looking for input, he asks regularly and he appreciates input when it's judiciously offered. But it's not a productive way to do things, for everybody to, to offer their two cents. It's just, I think, beyond anything else, it's just the most inefficient way to do things. You've got one of the greatest band leaders leading the band. Let them lead the band. Mm -hmm. You're a soldier and be a good one, you know. Don't break ranks, you know. I certainly don't want to harp on this, but when you are experiencing those moments of kind of like not believing something's going to work, even if ultimately it does work, are those the moments when you feel like this is a gig? Not at all. Not at all. I mean, I, I have got, I've got my dream gig, you know. This yeah. is really what I wanted to do. It's funny. Every now and then, a fellow jazz musician, I mean, I still think of myself as a jazz musician, and there are things that I really love to do that I don't get to do on this gig. But like, quite often, jazz musicians will talk to me, you know, almost sort of commiserate about like, you know, this is my day gig or this is, you know, the gig that makes the money and then when do you get to do what you really want? It's, no, this is really what I want to do and I'd be a fool not to make the most of it and really enjoy it. It's such a privilege. I get to make really fantastic music every night with with one of my absolute heroes and the music is fantastic and the fellow musicians are fantastic right up to the top you know I think yes as a as a side man quite often you are playing with people or playing music that isn't your cup of tea that's just it just so happens that that's not the case on this gig I can't think of many other gigs there's a short list that I've made of the sort of gigs that that would be remotely comparable um hmm. I find it hard to imagine how I would do a, you know, just your average backing singer gig because this isn't it. It's so great and I can't imagine anything, you know, measuring up. Well, it seems from an outside perspective that the feeling is mutual or that there's some reciprocation there because you started out in a group of singers and the project that you were brought in on originally was a, to be part of a group and now you most recently have been the only backing vocalist. That basically happened as the result of one song that Sting kind of threw in that wasn't on the record, that we didn't shed, basically. We didn't shed it as a group, and he kind of threw it in, in later on in the rehearsal period. And it, and being a massive long-time Sting fan, I knew the song and I knew the backing vocals, which were pretty extensive. And we were walking to lunch, and I said, oh, hey, well, if you want the harmonies on that, just let me know and I'll sort of throw them in. And so I did so, and I was the only one that knew it. And I assumed that if he liked the harmonies that he was going to get all of us to then jump in. It was just kind of an experiment. But I think having listened to him so much, I mean, definitely, definitely more by an order of magnitude than any other artist on the planet uh, that, that I've listened to. I've listened to Sting the most, for sure. You know, I had a really strong understanding of his phrasing, and so I was phrasing with him very closely right from the get-go. And I think, you know, he hadn't experienced that approach to it really before because also I was really just trying to match his sound and sound like him because he does almost all the backing vocals on his on his albums. So I was just trying to sound like him or like a, you know, female version of him. And he hasn't really had that before, um, but that's what's on all the records. Uh, in the past, there's been a more kind of traditional usual approach to the backing vocalist which often tends to be you know three or four girls quite often african-american singers different approach a gospel sort of sound that have their own sound as a unit that is another texture another sort of sound a separate texture a separate texture exactly whereas the approach that i was taking is basically if i'm not heard if i'm heard almost subliminally as an extra part of his voice then i'm doing my job well and I think for now mm -hmm. that's something he's really enjoying it's something he always is searching for something new and a different approach and and so that's been something that that for now he's digging and you know lucky me yeah it's a sort of element that you miss when it's gone you know you might right. not even be aware of what it's doing but when right. it's gone you you know something's missing something exactly. important is missing 
At what point did you tell Sting what a big fan you had been? I mean, it sort of happened in degrees. I think he was, I guess, pleasantly freaked out when I told him about the thing on the paper. And I think that was a really quite a way into the first tour that I did as the sole backing singer. Because what had happened is that he had, straight after this winter project, he had scheduled a big world tour with orchestras and there wasn't going to be a backing singer at the last minute after this project. He, he said, oh, maybe we'll just have Joe join us. And it, it kind of was a very last minute addendum to, to that tour. And on that tour... You- He's fronting an orchestra and you're off to the side sort of standing on a yeah. platform. That's the one. That I've seen on YouTube anyway. Yeah, that's the yeah one I've it seen. turned into, you know, 350 performances. And it's basically an orchestra and then Sting's band, in, you know, playing together. Yeah, it was well into that that I kind of really, really let him know. I mean, I think that's that was also one of the things, the, the sort of things that people might not think of as being the reason you keep your job and the reason that people want to keep hiring you that have maybe nothing to do with music, like punctuality. And for instance, okay, so he's obviously made a fair amount of funny through, <laughs> through his albums and songs. But if you're at the pub, buy a round of drinks. You know, everyone should take their round. And you know, I'm Australian, so buying a round of drinks is a very high... <laughs> high priority for me you know not always sitting and gushing about what a fan you are but treating people like a a normal person you know he doesn't need to hear what a fan I am he it's it's hopefully demonstrated by the fact that you knew all of the backing vocal parts of that one tune yeah and I'd rather demonstrate that in my dedication than than kind of gush and and ask for the photograph or (laughs) you know so early on I didn't do those things um and I think that also may be made a difference and hopefully indicated that I was there for the music and that that music is how I had ended up there and not a pursuit of fame or a pursuit of being next to someone famous you know that I really just was there for the music before anything else among other things that led to your participation in this film or you're being included in the film 20 Mm -hmm. feet from stardom which really focuses mostly on the kinds of backing vocalists that you describe generally African-American singers with big voices Mm -hmm. that kind of are their own texture, a separate texture. And have become a standard sort of texture that you do want to hear, you know, it's part of the sound now. But in that movie, in the midst of all of these characters, there you are. What was that project like to be a part of? Well, it was really interesting. One thing I really respect about the way they did it, Morgan Neville and and Catron Rogers, who who put it together, and it it was led by Gil Friesen, who unfortunately passed away just before it was finished. Um, and it was Gil who brought me in. He's a good friend of Sting. He was the head of A&M Records when, when the police were starting out, I think. And so that's how I got brought in, was, was through the executive producer. And, and I think he was very interested in my story. Morgan and Kate were very interested in my story. And I did many days of interviews and they came to gigs and one thing I really respect about the way they did it was that they had no idea how the film was going to turn out so in their initial ideas about the film they suspected that I would be a really big part of it because one of the things that was interesting is okay well what is this like from a person from a different background I'm you know I I was one of the only non-American people on there as well and and I had come definitely not from doing that I'd come from being a soloist you know I think Sometimes it goes the other way, like being a backing singer and then moving to being a soloist in a way, I'd come the other way around. And so their idea was that I was going to be a very large part of it, I think. And also I was on the road a lot and it was kind of tracking me through what turned out to be quite a painful breakup and not one of the best sort of most shining years of my life. I mean, in terms of career it was, but I was not really emotionally in a great place. And there was a lot of interesting prodding I think in some fairly emotional interviews which I was so worried that we're going to make it into the film according to Morgan I was a really significant part of the initial cut and then in their focus groups or whoever you know when they're showing the film everybody said oh we're really interested in this girl but she's in a different movie there's she doesn't fit with the narrative of everything else and like so many things the whole is is very important what binds the story together and while I might have been an interesting part as an individual I didn't fit the greater good you know I didn't fit the whole the rest of the story story. yeah I didn't help to tell that story and so they just selected the bits where I did help to tell that story talking about other singers and frankly I was you know Morgan actually called me to tell me you know he said I want to talk to you about the film before you see it and I was thinking oh god (laughs) this is because I look like a complete basket case and you know he wants to prepare me and he was like 
I, I just want to let you know that you aren't as much in the final edit as we thought that you would be and it's not that we you know blah 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 right. and all I could just see or I just felt this wave of relief wow. wash over me that it wouldn't really be it was you know one of the cha- most challenging 18 months of my life and and it wasn't really what I wanted to project to most of the world for the first time mm-hmm. actually so the way that all turned out I was pretty happy with and also I am in some ways my story's pretty boring it's not boring to me I'm very excited about where my story's going but there have been the requisite amounts of struggle and, you know, there's a, the little tidbits like, oh, you know, yeah, I was living out of my car for a really short time or whatever. But Wait, hold on. Let's go back to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's but it's really just it was a short period of time and, and I was a broke student and I thankfully I didn't have the money to buy a ticket back home. Otherwise, I probably would have gone back home. You know, I was trying to stay in New York and as everyone knows, this is a tough town. But ultimately, my story is girl wants gig girl gets gig she is really happy everything is great it's not like it's not that exciting <laughs> not and, interesting. Lot of, yeah. and also i think the 20 feet from stardom thing you know i think they also wanted to look at what is a very real story for a lot of people backing singing being some kind of second prize to to being the so being front and center and it isn't to me i mean on the contrary, I, I am very excited about the album I'm making and I love being a band leader. But a lot of the time when I'm doing this gig, I'm thinking it's it's hard for me to be motivated to pursue my solo career because I find this so fruitful and fulfilling mm-hmm. and it it's hard to be motivated. You know, the grass doesn't look that green on the other side because the grass is pretty green over here. You yeah. Know? Were you writing a lot of songs before... I know on the record that you, it sounds like you want to put some distance between you and your first record, but even on that record, you were writing. You were writing songs that actually kind of sounded like standards almost, like new standards in a way. I didn't write many things from scratch. I would either set some pre-existing lyrics to music or the other way. Um, I did write one song, but I didn't write that song for a record. I wrote it for my boyfriend at the time as an apology for being really bitchy one day and I think that's why it actually ended up working is because I I wasn't writing it to be a good song I was really paralyzed writing wise for a long time because I would end up writing maybe one song a year and it used to end up being probably for a, a an assignment for college and and work its way into my repertoire because I'm I'm so intimidated by the blank page and I set out trying to do something good or you know hopefully perfect which you you're done from the beginning when you do that and so I wasn't really writing and it was this one big change in my approach which was don't try to write a good song just try to write a song and that changed everything and that was pretty recent that was only a couple of years ago uh, and it was also it was partly through this um Doug Womble encouraged me to join this song club, which was kind of spearheaded by Adam Levy. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it was this thing where they would send out a title every Sunday and you had to upload your track by Thursday. And it was just the pressure of having to produce something. And just, you know, I really took my focus off trying to make things good. And I just wrote. And what came out really surprised me. And I was really excited by what emerged when I was more process oriented than goal oriented and in actual fact those songs for that club actually make up more than half the album that that I'm making now you know I never started any of them thinking they were worth a damn like I would be writing something and thinking well this is a piece of crap but I, I gotta finish it because I gotta get up I gotta upload by it Thursday. by Thursday <laughs> I agree with you that in terms of process particularly when it comes to writing the trick is not that I have at all mastered it but in, in my own life too just you have to do it yeah. you know and I wanted to do it so yeah. badly, so why wasn't I doing it? You said it because, you know, you hold yourself to such a high standard, this impossible standard. And then maybe once a year, some miraculous thing will happen where you will sit down and write something that you think is really great and it's really easy. Yeah. And so, you know, you assume that if it isn't always that easy, then it isn't that good. Yeah. Waiting for the thunderbolt of inspiration. It just almost never happens. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so you're finishing a record, but it sounds like you have, I don't want to say mixed emotions, but you you certainly are not 100% focused on your solo career. So how do you, how are you going to ne- negotiate between these two parts of your life? It comes in waves. I, I'm really excited about the music. I'm excited about, I'm cautiously optimistic that these songs might move some people. I'm really curious to find out how people feel about them because I'm so close to them now, I have no 
perspective. But uh, I have an absolute burning desire to put this album out and to perform it, but it's really hard. (laughs) I hate making phone calls and trying to organise gigs and work out a tour and do that stuff that I have totally remedial skills at. It's much easier to, you know, let... Sting's amazing tour manager, take care of all the details and turn up to work and sleep in a five-star hotel and have great catering. (laughs) All right, don't talk about it more. You're going to make people very envious. (laughs) But it is funny, like on YouTube, if you type in your name, like the first couple videos are you with Sting and all these amazing gigs. And then there's this one thing from you in the Time Out New York offices promoting (laughs) a gig. Hopefully the gap between those two will will close ever so slightly. (laughs) I'm absolutely sure that it will. One of the things that I kind of was curious about when I heard your first record was... just about the role of the female jazz singer today, mm. because you are a great jazz singer. This new record that I've only heard a couple of tracks of, it, it does, it's not as obvious that it's a jazz singer's record. Mm-hmm. But on your first record, you really are a jazz singer and a great jazz singer and a hip and interesting jazz singer. But, you know, sometimes I wonder, like, what real space there is in contemporary music for the jazz singer like you know what the ultimate career for the jazz singer would be as a soloist yeah that's I mean I was kind of stumped by that as well which is probably (laughs) partly why I've gone in this direction I'm not uh I'm definitely not interested in the um kind of low-cut cocktail dress crooning you know oldie timey standards I love standards i feel like I can't ethically do a lot of scatting, you know, recording and performing scatting because I don't really want to listen to it. So I think, well, who, you know, I have fun doing it, but who am I to, (laughs) who am I to make other people listen to it, I guess. The, The music that can still fall under the jazz banner, vocal or otherwise, uh, that I am, that I think has a life and has a future and that I'm interested in is when you think of it less as a set of, um, sounds or melodic or harmonic conventions or or processes and start to look at if if instead of thinking what like jazz is a question of what if it's a question of why why are you doing this what's your philosophy behind it if freedom of phrasing or discovering something new or I think the values of jazz when it started are a long way from the values of jazz now and so I think I'm interested in the core good values that jazz can allow you to explore as a musician, freedom and discovery and creativity and dissonance and Hmm. discomfort and interaction and connection and newness. All those things to me are interesting and I think great jazz is often the best expression of those things, not that it's not available in some contemporary classical music or whatever, but I do think those values in the best kind of jazz, vocal or otherwise, those values rise to the surface and those values are what makes the music great. Yeah, my dad says that, you know, you can think of it as an approach. Exactly. You know, jazz is an approach. There's a much more succinct way of saying exactly no, but I what love, I meant. <laughs> I love hearing you say that. I thought, well, that's, that really is the sort of the full answer to jazz as an approach. I love the idea of those being values that you can bring to any music and to any project that you do. Also, it's so easy because there is there's a lot of bad jazz being made. It's easy to say that jazz isn't good anymore. And there was, there's always been, a, there's a lot of crappy versions of every kind of thing every kind of music every kind of food whatever you know yeah. um and i think um you know it's important not to throw the baby out with the bathwater but just to try to be vigilant within with vigilant in in yourself and vigilant with how what you bring to the bandstand and how you interact with musicians and what you're pursuing being being true so speaking of being true being vigilant and what you're pursuing if you had to write down on a piece of paper today it couldn't be one Thing. There's a pull, a split in me. I still love doing what I what I was pursuing quite heavily before, which was I wanted to be the first call singer for instrumentalists who wanted a voice on their music. I would have probably been happy if I never sang another lyric even. I wanted to use my voice as an instrument and I wanted to be the first person anyone thought of, you know, when they thought, what singer will help make my music sound good? That's what I wanted to, to do. So when Fred Hirsch you know, invited me to be part of the Fred Hirsch Pocket Orchestra, that was my current equivalent of I, I want to work with Sting, you know, that, and I still have a strong desire to do those things and I'm still really, really excited when somebody 
like Fred or Theo Blackman or, or, you know, someone that I admire from that world asks me to collaborate with them. I just get as much of a rush as, as I do from performing with Sting. But that said, I really want to find out if I can offer something as a, as a writer. I have wanted to write and perform my own songs since I was 12, you know, since I started having post-pubescent emotions, you know. I've wanted to do that and I've always felt like I, well, I wouldn't ever be able to produce anything good enough. And now I'm kind of opening that window a crack to explore the question, well, maybe I do have something to offer. And so I'm putting this album out into the world with some kind of trust that it will be received kindly and at least then I'll know that I I, I gave it a try and God, I'm not really answering the question no it's a well great there, answer but... and it opens up a couple of other questions for me one is were you writing at 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 were you writing your own songs you know I wrote a little bit in my teens and I wrote a couple of songs for especially sort of later teens um you know I wrote a song for a, a boyfriend who was a musician who was older than me and you know, he kind of thought it was a bit silly, I think. And I, I was so crushed. I was just, I was so devastated uh, that I actually just stopped writing for several years. I didn't write another song for about another five or ten years after that. And then I started writing a, a little bit. But it, I think I was really scarred by that. I thought I, I must not be able to write songs. I, and so I always wanted to and I always would think about it and I would write down ideas in my little song book, you know, like lyric book, and I, but I would, never, I would never finish them and I sure as heck wouldn't play them in private like, or even to one person, let alone in public at a performance. It would just no way. So feeling some confidence as a songwriter is, is a very new thing for me you know, I've I've had some kind ears listen to some of these songs and the thing that has made me feel like maybe I have something to offer is the very first song from this group that I played on a gig. Um, it was when the song was very raw for me as well. I'd just written it and it was about something that was going on that was pretty hard. And I sang the song and I, and I looked out and I saw quite a few people <laughs> in tears which I thought, okay, well... I wanted to move people and maybe I don't have to sing Da Williams' February or Randy Newman's I'll Never Get Over Losing You. Mm-hmm. Maybe I can sing something from my story and, and I want to try to do that. I was not sure if I still wanted to be a singer. When I came to New York, I was kind of on a reconnaissance trip in 2001 and um, and I went and saw Cassandra Wilson at the Blue Note, who I was a huge, huge fan of at the time and, and still am. And she had me in tears and, and I was I was quite emotional through the course of the set. And afterwards, the person that I was with, I was so, totally silent and I wasn't really talking. And, and he was saying, well, did you not, did you like it? Did, did you not like it? Are you okay? What's going? And finally, I just kind of dissolved and I said, I, I want to make people feel like that. I thought maybe I didn't want to sing anymore, but now I know that I do because of what I want to do to other people what she just did to me you know um and that was a real that was another turning point of yes i i want to do this yeah i imagine that considering some of the early music that you listened to was sting and the music of sting that having him agree to sing a duet with you of one of your original songs on your new record which he did has got to be the biggest vote of confidence you could have ever asked for in your songwriting yeah, and it, it's just such a testament to his generosity uh, as well because I owe so much to to the faith that he's placed in me and to the gig the, the gig that he's given me and it, it has changed my life and he is an incredibly generous boss and has given me so much limelight as a soloist on his gig and I would never dream of asking. I'm, we're so far into gravy town in terms of what he's offered me that, that I would never, I feel like I never want to ask him for anything because I'm so in the red at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, so when, you know, he kept sort of offering to be involved on, on the album, I kept kind of changing the subject every time it would come up because I felt embarrassed and I didn't want to ask. I didn't want to impose. And finally we were sitting, you know, we're sitting waiting for another flight and he brought it up again and he said, oh, just do some oohs and ahs, like whatever, you know, whatever you want me to do. And I kind of laughed it off again. And then finally he's like, you know, I mean, look, if it undermines like your Brooklyn cool or whatever. <laughs> and I, it finally occurred to me, oh, this incredibly amazing artist and wonderfully generous man is offering to sing. He's been, he has been offering 
not emptily mm-hmm. to sing on my album and I've been so kind of putting fobbing, him putting him off. And, of, you know, I said uh, that, of course, of course I want you to, but I just don't want you to feel like you're doing it because you have to or anything. Mm-hmm. And I, thank goodness he convinced me that that it was something he would actually be into doing. And, yeah. he was, and there was a song that I had written that I had him very much in mind because it was very much kind of in his wheelhouse. And I played it to him and he said, that that sounds perfect. Let's, let's do that. Well, I suspect that he won't lose his faith in you, but... Um, <laughs> But it just sort of occurred to me, right, that, you know, you talk about the overwhelming anxiety of looking at the blank page for so long and holding yourself accountable into such a high standard that you weren't able to write. It almost seems like an impossible thing, right, that Sting would dig your songwriting after being afraid to write and then ultimately offer to sing with you and then you have this song with him. But on the other hand, it's like, you know, I could imagine you saying, look, I played some songs for, you know, a couple people that I know and they sort of dug them. And so I thought maybe I can be good at this. But it sounds like right, right from the from the jump, you started writing and you were surrounded by really talented songwriters and people that are very gifted songwriters yeah. like Adam and like Doug. And I have yeah. no idea who else is in that group, but I suspect that they keep good company. So it mm-hmm. would be good writers that you got that positive reinforcement. And sometimes like maybe just to break that feedback loop of negativity, that's what it takes. It's just, you know, somebody that you wouldn't even expect that would dig it to just go, yeah, this is good. Definitely. And Doug Womble was another huge, hugely encouraging factor. And and the thing that happened at the same time as the song club was him. And so this is another weird cosmic thing, which was I had been, been thinking about how much I wanted to try some co-writing basically just as a way to avoid writing on my own and, and and looking at the blank page which I still don't find any easier than I did before I always need some parameters or some kind of trigger and I thought well maybe I'll just think about who I really want to do some writing with and came up with two people which was Becca Stevens and Doug Womble and I didn't know Doug's music as well and I also suspected that you know Becca I think Becca is is fairly like pursues things in a solo I don't, you know, I know she's done some amazing co-writing, but it, it, I almost felt like, okay, well, I know, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I just, I just thought, yeah, out of those two, I think Doug, that makes the makes most sense. And I, I downloaded a couple of his albums from iTunes and I was in Toronto at the time and I walked kind of from one end of Toronto to the other, listening to his albums on, on repeat and then came back and thought, okay, well, when I get back uh, from tour, I'm going to just, I'm going to do it. I'm going to call Doug Womble. I'm going to, you know, <laughs> ask him if he wants to write with me. And then that evening I got a phone call from Doug saying, hey, I've just been thinking about doing some co-writing with someone and uh, you, I just thought of you. And I thought, Doug doesn't even know who I am. How did this happen? But it was another weird Unbelievable. sort of thing. So I sat with Doug and we kind of churned out a whole bunch of songs so fast. We had such a good writing chemistry and um, we wrote what I, I hope, I think, are some really great songs together really fast. But what was interesting is, is how often, on, on the one hand, I loved writing with Doug and I, I really love those songs and I love the things that he brought to the songs that I could never have brought to the songs. Mm. But so often there was also times when I just think, oh man, I just really want full control over this and I don't, you know, and I didn't want it to be subject to anybody else's opinion or a vote. So that made me see like well maybe I do want to do some writing on my own and then from then it kind of snowballed as well that's funny that by recognizing that somebody else was going to do something and had a different idea that wasn't yours you actually heard what your ideas were that much uh, uh, more amplified louder yeah absolutely I had such a good time doing that with Doug that I started to think hey maybe this is Maybe this is the new career I want is writing for other people. You know, I wasn't really seeing myself pursuing a career. I was still thinking, you know, I'm a jazz singer and I'm not really, I never would have thought that my next album would be all originals at that point. Not at all. And I was thinking, wow, I I like these songs and they're not for me, but but I, I, I like them for someone else. So are some of these songs on the record originally songs that you thought you would, would never sing or would not be for you? Actually, no. No, not these. Uh, these are all songs. And in fact, these ones, I, f- for my first effort of an album of original material, I decided I wanted to restrict it exclusively to songs that I wrote completely on my own. So mm-hmm. there aren't actually any co-writes here. But I have to say, I mean, I really hope that for the next album I'll be able to include some of those co-writes that, mm-hmm. that Doug and I wrote together because I really, I, I dearly love some of those songs. Um, there's a lot of things that I wanted to do on this record because... It feels like a debut in a lot of ways. Um, and one of those things is having material that I entirely 
own myself, and I don't just mean publishing-wise, but just personally, uh, that this is me speaking. And in in the same vein, um, I would have loved to work with a producer, uh, but I didn't feel ready to surrender that control, first of all. And I guess I wanted to say, okay, well, this is what this is me just on my own. I mean, that said, Will Vinson, who's... Um, who we're getting married actually in in a couple of months, and he's a spectacular musician who plays on the record, and he was my ears in the booth, and I had no idea how much I would I would need him, and so he's definitely taken on a co-producing role, kind of accidentally and semi reluctantly on both our counts, um, but thankfully, uh, hmm. but I really wanted to say, okay, well this is what I produce on my own this is me I I don't ever really want to do another album without a producer again I really hope that I can work with somebody to elicit some different things Mm -hmm. from me but that said I didn't want that to happen from the beginning because I always want somebody to be able to go back and say okay well that's her that's just her and that's got to be our starting point um you know I I wanted I wanted to not have you know I'm not I am you know I'm not a super experienced uh singer songwriter producer you know at this point but i am not you know the latest winner of american idol who needs somebody to, to develop that to de- yeah to shape an artistic vision around my voice you know i feel i actually feel like as a vocalist i don't feel um that special you know i don't think my voice is anything to write home again about really hmm. in a way i think it's what my brain does with my voice and what you know concept yeah it's it's sort of the things that I've learned to do um so I definitely want to wanted to kind of be in full control of that for the first outing just just to say okay this is me and now I want to meet some other people what's happened what happens next Mm -hmm. you know this is this is who I am here nice to meet you Well, Joe, I am really excited to hear what happens next, whatever it is. And thank you again so much for having this conversation with me. Thanks for having me. It's been really, really fun.